morning, church. It's so good to be here with you this morning. Uh, I'm pretty jazzed up because uh, for Sunday school I got to talk a bunch of theology this morning, and that always gets me. I just love it. I get to use a bunch of big words that I paid a lot of money to learn, so uh, it's been really great. Uh, really encourage you to join us for that. We're going through our statement of faith, and uh, it's fun for me. So I will <laughs> see how it is for everybody else. Um, let's go Lord in prayer as we enter into his word. Father God, uh, this morning as we continue our way uh, through the book of 1 John, um, we thank you, Lord, for the words here. We thank you, Lord, for um, not just the wisdom, but the love, Lord, that uh, obviously rubbed off on your apostle John as he was writing this letter. It's plain to see the love that he just constantly has for people. Um, ask so that you would help us to be people who, who, who are known to be people of love, people who love others. What they, what they meant to be a slight against Jesus Christ, uh, the, the thought of the Son of God as a friend of sinners, is actually, I think, one of your crowning glories. Um, ask, we ask, Lord, that you would help us in the same way to be people who are, are willing to be um, loving and kind, um, gracious and patient. Um, the Christians can be trustworthy people. Help us, Lord, to be trustworthy in what we do and what we say. I ask, Lord, that you would convict our hearts uh, as we continue to make our way through this, as we see your incredible love for us, Lord, might it humble us and lead us to be um, more like you each day. We thank you, Lord, for your love shown to us in a variety of ways, the beauty of the place that we live, um, the warmth of the sunshine, um, and just, Lord, your presence here with us today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This, uh, my wife will tell you, I, I was uh, still working on this one Thursday night. This was the tougher, one of the tougher sections of Scripture I feel like I've uh, preached on in a bit, so uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat that for you. But uh, as John continues his, his writing here in 1 John chapter 2, um, he's still writing to his congregation. The members of the church uh, who have clung to faith, a group of people he refers to at the beginning of the chapter as his dear children. From last week, you'll remember that this chapter uh, began with commands concerning love. The Christians must, it's not, a, it's not a, an aspirational thing, Christians must love their brother or sister. And not just tolerate them, not just put up with them, but actually love them with a Christ-like love. John uses a, a very powerful Greek term for love, agape, in verse 10, to describe Christian love. You've probably, hopefully, uh, heard about agape before. I hope this isn't the first sermon you've ever heard where, where someone brought up agape. Agape love stands in contrast to the other kinds of love in Greek. And I've talked before, love is one of those words that's, I don't know if it's just abused in our culture or what it is. It can mean so many different things. You can say, I love my wife, I love my house, I love my car, I love this spaghetti. And hopefully you mean something different with all of those uses of the word love. I hope you don't love your wife in the same way that you love spaghetti. In Greek, and this is one of the beautiful things in Greek, is that they had different terms for love that made it very plain what sort of love they were speaking of. There was eros love, which is this romantic, passionate love. Philia, which is this affectionate, friendly, or brotherly love. Think of Philadelphia, right? When I, when I think of Philadelphia uh, Eagle football fans, that's what I think of. They're just the most loving, caring people. So that, that makes it really easy to remember Philia. Um, storge is the love of family, family, familial love. And then agape is this selfless, universal love. Agape love is unique and it's set apart. It's the love of Christ on the cross. Uh, it is holding nothing back. It is giving all. It's the highest form of love and it's used time and time again in scripture to describe the, the sort of covenantal love of God for his people and also our reciprocal love to God. Agape love is the love owed by us to God. It's the love that we reciprocate back to him with. John commanded his readers to love one another with this sort of selfless all-in love. This kind of love, Jesus said, is what we should be known for. John 13, 35. 
Though the word agape is used often in the Bible and has these deep Christian roots, uh, deep ties to Christianity, it was also used outside of Scripture. Uh, it's, it's used in some of the very earliest Greek writings, even appearing in Homer, where it's often translated as affection. So to return to the letter that we're reading, uh, we've been implored by John to be people of love, to be known for our love. He's always using this term agape, a form of that term agape. There can be no such thing as a Christian that doesn't love their brother or sister. But in the second half of chapter 2, John noticeably changes tone and offers a command of what we're not to love. 1 John chapter 2, words will be on the screen, but it's always good to follow along in the Bible if you can. Starting in verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of, the, of God lives forever. John uses the exact same word here for love. He uses that same term, agape. There's no change there. So how can we make sense of this? Because some of the most important passages in the New Testament uh, seem to point us in a different direction. John 3.16, for God so loved, uh, and that's still agape, it's higape uh, sane, the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then Matthew 5, 43 and through 45, you have heard that it was said, you shall love agape seis, your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love agape, agape seite, your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be fought, sons of your father who is in heaven. The same Greek root word, all used every time, agape, is used in all of these passages. What is the instruction? What are we actually supposed to do? What should our relationship with the world actually look like? I would suggest that we interpret and understand the passage this way. John is offering a warning that there are two choices that stand before every person, even longtime followers of Jesus Christ. Either today we will love the Father or we will love the world. And again, he's, he's using the word agape, an ultimate, all in, holding nothing back, love that's reserved for the way that we are to love God. When John uses the word world, in the Greek it's cosmos, he can mean either the created material universe, which is good, or the world of sin that stands in opposition to God. In 1 John 2, he's speaking of the latter. The cosmos that represents the unredeemed world, a world in darkness that lies under God's judgment. John has in mind that Christians are to avoid an infatuation with worldly godlessness, which again, as we've spoken of before, looks good to our eyes. Growing up, I, I always thought that sin was this obviously evil, dripping with oil nastiness, the sort of mistake you could see coming from a mile away. When in reality, sin is a corruption of a good thing, a need for, an obsession with, a craving for some good thing. The money isn't the problem. The love of money is. Love of an affection isn't a problem. Finding it in unhealthy places is. Success is not an issue. Not being able to go on without it is. To illustrate what this looks like for us, John offers us three examples Right here in verse 16, uh, he, he summarizes all of human sin into a list of three short phrases. I think this is the most concise, or succinct list encompassing all of human sin that we can find in Scripture. Three phrases he uses to summarize it all. The first is the desire of the flesh, or the lust of the flesh, the lust of sarks, flesh. This does not necessarily have to do with sensuality. Usually this is the one we think of when we think of sensuality. But the desire of the flesh certainly has to do with human desires rather than divine desires. John has in mind any sinful interest that draws us away from God or makes fellowship with God impossible. The second is the desire of the eyes or the lust of the eyes. The phrase shares the same noun as the first, epithumia, which means desire. 
In the ancient Near East, the eye was where corruption entered the body. We see that in Matthew 5, 28. Examples include Eve looking at the forbidden tree, which was pleasing to the eye, Genesis 3, 6. Or David looking at Bathsheba as she bathed, 2 Samuel eleven two. The third is this boastful pride of life. Unholy pride in what one has. The boaster is someone who promises more than they can perform. John has in mind an attitude of pretentious arrogance or subtle elitism that comes from one's view of wealth or rank or stature in society. It's an overconfidence that makes us lose any notion that we are or could ever be dependent on God. These are the things we are not to love. And we are not to embrace. The things we cannot tolerate in ourselves, the things we need to speak up about when we see a brother or a sister in Christ struggling with. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, they encompass all of human sin and constitute the worldly way of thinking and being that we must absolutely oppose. Before moving on to the rest of the chapter, I want to have a word on the importance of this and the application for us of John's command to not love the world or anything in it. Because otherwise, this is just another letter. And otherwise, this is just another sermon where, you hear, where we're told to do the good thing, love God and love others, and to avoid the bad thing, loving and embracing selfishness. There's challenges that the church of God has faced and will continue to face. Uh, I think about this almost daily, the sorts of social changes and social challenges um, that I am going to need to grapple with in my time as a pastor. There are many problems in the world, many arrows aimed at the truth of Scripture. To answer them, we'll need to continue to turn to the truth of the gospel. And we'll need to continue to resemble Jesus Christ. Because if people don't experience this as us as Christians embodying both the truth and the love of Christ, then we'll just be another group of people talking about a hypothetical faith that we aren't actually participating in. My other thought, and I find a lot of peace in this, is that I know that God has firmly protected, guided, and led his church for 2,000 years, and he isn't finished with us. What we cannot afford to do is to refuse to take God seriously. God is speaking to us through his apostle John to warn us about loving the world and the things of the world. He warns us of this because we are in trouble and we barely even recognize it. We're already in the muck. We've already taken the bait. We're already enjoying what appears to be a blessing. But is the sin that John warns us of, the lust of the flesh, the lust lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, do do we understand that that we're already customers of those things? David F. Wells, in his book, God in the Wasteland, the Reality of Truth in a World of Fading Dreams, writes, it is one of the defining marks of our time that God is now weightless. I do not mean by this that he is ethereal, but rather that he has become unimportant. He rests upon the world as inconsequentially as not to be noticeable. He has lost his saliency, his prominence in human life. Those who assure the pollsters of their belief in God's existence may nonetheless consider him less interesting than television, his commands less authoritative than their appetites for affluence and influence, his judgments no more awe-inspiring than the evening news and his truth less compelling than the advertiser's sweet fog of flattery and lies. The challenge for us, before we even begin to examine our hearts and and see if the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life are affecting our walk with God, before we even start to self-examine, we need to ask, do I take God seriously? Do I believe him? When he says things like sin will destroy you, do I believe him? Do I take him seriously? John takes God seriously. And so in the remainder of chapter 2, John turns up the heat even more. 
While still speaking to faithful believers in the church, John warns them about immediate and ongoing threats. So let's read the rest of chapter, uh, almost to the end of chapter 2, I guess, uh, 18 to 27. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the, uh, as, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their, on, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? Who is, is, it is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. John's urgency and passion comes through in this passage. He again addresses his audience as dear children, showing an awful lot of care and concern for them but also by the announcement that it's now the last hour. Two things signal to John that they're now in the last hour. The first is the appearance of what he calls antichrists. Technically, anyone who opposes Christ and stands against the gospel. The second signal to John is the breaking down of his church, evidenced by people leaving the body of believers. A question comes to, my, to mind, and hopefully it came to your mind too as you were reading this, uh, in what sense is it the last hour? How can this possibly make sense? Because, you know, in case you haven't noticed, we're still here. Quite a few hours have passed since John, since John said that it was the last hour. Some scholars have gone so far as to suggest that uh, for New Testament author uh, writers, <clears throat> the phrase the last hour implied the time right before the end, and so therefore, logically, John must have just been wrong. While there were definitely some people at that time that, that thought that Christ was returning and that the end was imminent, uh, I think of the church in Thessalonica, who the Christians there had quit their jobs and ran out of money and started begging on the streets because they were so convinced that Christ's return was that soon. Um, it wasn't the case for John, and it wasn't the case for other New Testament writers either. Peter, for instance, acknowledged that there were people scoffing at the church because Christ had not yet returned. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7, Peter writes, Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and, and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. These early writers, like Peter and John, understood that when God stepped foot on planet earth in the person of Jesus Christ, we entered into a new day, a new era, a, a time of, of, of already but not yet, where God's restoration was promised and the price was paid by Christ on the cross. But we're still living in a world with scoffers and doubters. We're still living in a world with antichrists who deny and oppose the reality of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It may be helpful to consider that John may have been speaking the, uh, theologically rather than chronologically. John understood that from the time of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, 
All that remains, the only minutes left to tick off the clock, involve Jesus marking the end by his return. That return would complete what his resurrection accomplished. Before wrapping up this chapter with the last two verses, there is one final thing I want to comment on. Uh, Throughout this section, verses 18 through 27, there's a play of words going on that I think is really important and hopefully really encouraging. Um, And it doesn't come through at all in the English translation. Those who have left John's church and now stand opposed to Christ and his gospel, he calls antichrists. And John says that those who cling to the gospel are anointed. Those are two important words, antichrists and anointed. The words antichrist and anointed both originate from the same Greek verb, creo, meaning to anoint. Um, It also means what is rubbed on. Why would John choose two words that represent these two completely opposed people, uh, two sorts of people, those who stand with Christ and those who stand opposed to him? Why would he use the same root word to describe both? The opponents of John's church, who he here calls antichrists, were claiming to have this special and supreme wisdom. They said they were superior. They said they had the truth. They said the truth had rubbed off on them. And instead of pulling the apostle card and confronting these false teachers with his own authority, John offers to help to strengthen his followers' faith. He uses the same root word, creo, to comfort his congregation, that they don't need to be victimized by people who claim to have some unique uh, prophetic gift of the Spirit of God, this counterfeit thing. John tells his people that they do have the Spirit. They have the ability to discern the truth, the way uh, of the Spirit of God at work in them. They are anointed. The Spirit has been rubbed on them. As confident as their opponents are, who doubt the truth of Christ's incarnation. Christians should be even more confident because we know, we know that what we have isn't counterfeit. What we have isn't some claim. What we have is the reality of God at work in us. It's truly rubbed on. It's truly um, anointed. And we know that truth isn't a matter of just experience. It's a matter of history. Our understanding of God is anchored in what has happened objectively, not in any person's perception of God. That truth is made sure and certain because God is alive and at work in us. Finally, John closes this chapter with one last encouragement. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Continue in him. Be confident in God. Put one foot in front of the other. And then John closes with words that we spoke about earlier. That if we know, if we have confidence that God is righteous, if we know that he does what is right and commands what is right, if we take God seriously, then we can be sure that whoever obeys him is born of him. Let's close in prayer. I close in this prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.